Do-it-yourself PC building has been rough for the past few years. Between supply shortages and the cost of goods going through the roof, it was better either holding onto what you had or simply not buying at all. However, things are finally starting to look up with prices dropping and availability increasing. Now is the time to build. And if you need some help with that, this is the video for you. Hey YouTube, I'm Danny with Danny's Tech Channel. PC building can be an overwhelming task if you've never done it. You can easily overspend if you don't know what parts to get. A thousand dollar build can quickly jump to over two grand if you're not careful. Make sure that you set yourself a budget and stick to it. That's important too. Today, I'll show you how easy it is to get into PC gaming and what you should be putting your budget into. I'm gonna show you the parts that I picked out for my build today and I'll even walk you through the entire build process step by step. Let's go. Building a PC may seem overly complicated, but it's really simple. I mean, as you can see, I only have a few parts here on the table and that is the computer. I'm gonna start with the processor. This is the Ryzen 5 5500. It's got six cores and 12 threads with a max boost of up to 4.2 gigahertz. I got this thing for $100. The 5500 is only PCI 3.0. And at this price range, I don't think you should go with 4.0 or 5.0, even though they're available. Because of this limitation, I decided to go with a B450 motherboard, which is also limited to 3.0, and you can still find them new. The board I have here is the Gigabyte B450M DS3H Wi-Fi. It's a micro ATX board. It supports Ryzen 5000 series processors out of the box, has four RAM slots, and has space for an M.2 NVMe SSD. It also has two 5-volt addressable RGB headers. Oh, and did I mention it has built-in Wi-Fi? That's a ton of features for only $80. That's right, $80 for this motherboard. 16 gigabytes of RAM is still the sweet spot for gaming. And because of the release of DDR5, DDR4 prices have dropped quite a bit. This motherboard uses DDR4 RAM. We'll be using the Team Group T-Force Vulcan Z 16 gigabyte kit, which comes with two eight gig sticks with a speed of 3,200 megahertz. This kit only cost me $44. And remember, the motherboard has two more RAM slots so if you decide that you want to upgrade later, you can always just buy another kit just like this and pop it in right beside the other one. For storage, I'm using a SATA SSD that I had lying around, but I don't recommend you do this if following this build guide for your own PC. The drive I'm using is the Samsung 860 EVO SSD. I only chose this drive because it didn't cost me anything extra since I already had it. This is a 2.5 inch SATA drive, which you must connect using two different cables, one for power and one for data transfer to the motherboard. Instead of going with a SATA SSD, I recommend that you go with an NVMe M.2 SSD. These drives are far superior in every way. They are much faster transfer speed, which means quicker load times in games, and they connect directly to the motherboard. They kind of look like a stick of gum. The Team Group MP33 is a drive I've been using a lot lately, and it's only $57 over on Newegg. So faster transfer speed, less cable clutter, and almost the same price? That's a no-brainer. Spend the few extra dollars, get an M.2. The power supply is one area I suggest you do not cheap out on. There's nothing worse than having to rip your entire system apart because a power supply went out because you decided to save a little bit of money. Now, I took a risk with this power supply since I've never used it before, but the reviews were good and the specs looked pretty good for the price. This is the Rosewill Capstone 550M. It's an 80 plus gold partially modular power supply. If you don't know what any of that means, it's pretty good specs and 550 watts is plenty of power for this build. I did a video of the basic understanding of power supplies and what each thing means, and I'll leave it right up here if you wanna learn more. The case is really up to your visual preference. The main recommendations I have when you're shopping for one are space for your components, a mesh front for great airflow, and comes in at a good price. Many people like features such as tempered glass and RGB lighting too. Who doesn't like to show off their build? The case I picked is Fractal Design's new Pop Mini Air. This is a micro ATX case to fit our micro ATX motherboard. And it comes with tempered glass, a mesh front panel, and three pre-installed addressable RGB fans. There's also a built-in controller in case your motherboard doesn't have a five volt addressable header. Now the price is where it gets interesting. This case comes in at $89.99 USD and they charge $11 for shipping. I know the case costs as much as the CPU, but what you're getting for your money is worth the cost. That, and you'll be looking at the case all the time, so you might as well get something that looks good. Don't you dare think about putting this on the floor. The keen eye may notice there's one thing missing from this pile of PC parts, the graphics card. 
That's because there isn't a box for the card I'm using today. I'm going with a used GPU for this build. That's right, used. You could go with new, and there's still some deals to be had. But to keep me under budget and give me the most performance for my dollar, we'll stick with this. You're looking at the MSI RTX 2060 Ventus OC. This is a six gigabyte GPU and Nvidia's lowest RTX card from the 20 series generation. The 2060 requires one eight pin power connector and only uses 160 watts. MSI recommends a 500 watt power supply when using this card. This is also the first time they introduced ray tracing into their GPUs. I picked this card up for only $150. That's no tax, no shipping, 150. This is everything we need to build our PC. I know it's a lie. If you need help with what parts are compatible with each other, I suggest you swing over to PC Part Picker. They have an easy to use website that not only tells you if parts are compatible, but it also shows the lowest known price for each part. I'll leave a link below if you wanna check it out. Okay, before I get started on the build, there's a few tools and items that you might wanna pick up before building your PC. The first thing you'll need is a screwdriver. I like to use my iFixit kit. It's nice and small. It comes with different bits. I've got the Phillips number two and the Phillips number one. In fact, it has every bit I could ever need. If you use one that's magnetic, it makes things a lot easier. Trust me. The next thing you'll want to grab is some wire ties or cable ties, zip ties, whatever you want to call them. Your case will come with some. Your power supply usually comes with some as well. If you're going to be doing this a lot, probably pick up some cable ties. And the last thing you'll need is some wire cutters or tin snips. You'll use this to cut the pigtails off of your cable ties. But that's all there is to it. You'll need a screwdriver, some cable ties, and wire cutters. And we're ready to build. Let's get going. First thing you'll do is get the motherboard out of the box. I like to set the motherboard up on the cardboard box. Don't worry about static discharge or anything. If you're that worried about it, you can plug in your power supply and plug the 24 pin connector in and that will ground the motherboard. Obviously you have to plug it into the wall also, but I've built hundreds of PCs using the box and I've never had a problem. First, I like to install the CPU. This is the most dangerous and fragile part since it's easy to bend pins if you're not careful. Flip the lever on the socket up and gently place the CPU down onto the board with the Ryzen text facing the back of the motherboard. There's also a gold triangle to line up with the triangle on the socket to be sure you're doing it right. Don't force it down. You should see the edge of the CPU sitting flat on the socket housing. Rotate the lever down and lock it in place. It's in. Might as well install the CPU cooler next since we're already here. I'm using the Inbox AMD cooler for this build, which is also the easiest install over something like an RGB air cooler or a liquid cooler. We need to remove the mounting brackets since AMD's stealth coolers don't use these for installation. It's four Phillips head screws, then they just lift off. The cooler comes with pre-installed thermal paste, so you don't even need to buy any. Simply place the cooler down while lining up the mounting screws with the backplate holes. Then tighten down in a crisscross pattern, applying even pressure on each screw. You'll need to press down on the screwdriver firmly while tightening to allow the screw threads to catch the hole. Just do a few turns on each one until all screws have started. Then tighten them up. They will stop turning when tight. Don't worry about the noise it makes. I know it makes you think you're breaking something. You're not. It's normal. Don't forget to plug in the fan connector after tightening down the cooler. Tuck your cable behind or beside the fan and you can find your PWM controlled header up on top on most motherboards. It'll be labeled CPU fan. This is normally where I would install my M.2 drive since you can just install it and forget it. You're gonna need your Phillips number one screwdriver head for this. The screws are very, very small. Sometimes they're installed in the motherboard like this, but sometimes they're in the bag in the motherboard box. All you're gonna do for the install is angle your drive into the slot, push in until you can't see any more gold contact pins on the drive, then you'll push down on the drive and install the screw. NVMe drives have a cutout so they can only be installed one way. That's it, that's all there is to it. The last part of prepping the motherboard is RAM installation. Consult your motherboard manual when installing your RAM, but most boards these days are the same layout. See how mine is black on two sockets and gray on the other two? Those show you where you should be placing your RAM kits. For mine, the manual shows to use the gray spots first. Pull the tabs outward on both sides. Some are only one-sided. Then line up the RAM stick with the slot. It's keyed like the M.2 drive, so it can only go in one way. Make sure it's lined up. Push the RAM down firmly. You will need to use some force on this, and it'll feel like you're about to break the motherboard. It'll be fine. Now you're ready to start putting stuff into your case. I like to strip down the case as much as possible to allow room to work 
and let as much light in as possible. This involves removing the glass and rear panels, front cover panels, and any dust filters. Install the motherboard next. I like to lay the case on its side for this step and let gravity help me out. Don't forget to snap the IO shield into the case. It just presses in on the rectangular opening in the back. Most motherboards have this built in now, but since I went with a B450 budget board, I have to install it myself. The motherboard should be sitting on seven standoff mounts, and you'll need to consult your case instruction manual for which screws you need for these standoffs. Sometimes it's just trial and error. Let's install the power supply. Since I have a partially modular one, my 24 pin and eight pin EPS connectors are already connected. And all I need to add is a SATA power cable and my PCI power connector for our GPU. Next, place the power supply into the back of the case with the fan facing down. The only time you'll be installing it face up is if you'll be putting the PC on the floor or on carpet, which I don't recommend. You'll need to route your cables to plug them in. This is the most tedious step and takes the longest to make it look neat. Your 8-pin EPS or CPU power cable goes at the top right if you're looking from the back of the case. Run that through the cutout on top. This is also a good time to plug the rear fan into the motherboard header. I like to plug in the header, then route the cable up to the EPS connector to hide it. Sometimes you can hide it behind the heatsink, but this motherboard doesn't have one, so I'll do what I can. I lucked out buying this case and once again justified spending the extra money. This motherboard only has one fan header besides the one for the CPU fan. Luckily, the case fans are daisy chainable, which means I can plug all of them into each other and then down into the singular fan header. The RGB connectors for all the fans work in this same daisy chain way and all plug into each other. Then they plug into the case controller at the top. You can also plug them into the motherboard for software control if you like. You can now plug the 24 pin motherboard power connector in. Pass the connector through the cutout and have it make a 180 degree bend to plug into the board. You'll hear a click and should see the latch engage. There are two cutouts on the bottom for the rest of your cables. Everything else will come through here. That's the reason I haven't installed the GPU yet. This gives you the most room to work. You'll need to pass your power switch, the USB 3.0, HD audio, and the PCI power connector for the GPU through these cutouts. You could pass through the RGB header too if you want to control your lighting in Windows, but I'm gonna be using the case's built-in controller. I also need to plug the SATA power connector attached to the case in. That can all be hidden in the basement with the extra cabling. It just provides power for the lights on the fans. I need to install my SSD. I'll secure the drive into a hard drive mount location. This case has tons of options for me. It uses four small screws for mounting. Then I need a SATA power connection, which I'll use the same cable I plugged the case SATA power into. Last cable for the SSD is the data connection. It's an L shape if you look at the connector. Plug in the motherboard side and the SSD end. They click into place the same way and hold tight. See why I said get an M.2? It's way easier. Now it's finally time for the graphics card. Remove a few PCI slot covers to allow access to the GPU's I.O. In my case, it's two. Some cards need three or four these days. Ensure the PCI latch is open by pressing on the latch at the end of the slot. Line up the graphics card PCI connector with the PCI slot on the motherboard. Always install it in the topmost slot since that will be your fastest one. Push the card in until you see the latch engage on its own. This will line everything up for you to install the two screws to secure the GPU from where you just removed the PCI slot covers. Next, you'll just plug in your power connector you routed through the bottom earlier it should give you a positive click. And the very last thing to do is cable manage everything. Tidy it all up and use the case's included cable ties to hold everything down nice and neat. There it is, you built your very own computer. I'm gonna load this thing up with Windows, get some games installed. If I showed you how to do all that, it would take a lot longer for this video. Hope it works. I found my way, I found my way. I was in the dark against it all, but made it through the day. Cause I find my way, I find my way In bad times, I know I'll be okay Cause I find my way
was in the dark against it all, but made it through the day. Cause I found my way. I found my way. I hope you enjoyed this build guide that I put together. When I started writing the script for this, I honestly didn't think about doing a complete build and walkthrough, but I figured I don't have one on the channel, so why not do it? It worked out well, and now when asked if I have a how to build a PC video, I can honestly answer, I do. Even though this was more of a tutorial on how to build a PC, I'll leave a parts list below if you wanna use this as a guide when shopping for your own parts. I think the CPU and motherboard combo is a great start to anyone's first build. This entire PC cost me under $600. If you tried to do that a year ago, it would have been impossible. If you're wondering what you should be doing after building your PC and you want a tutorial on that part, let me know down in the comments. If I have enough interest on a video like that, I'll make it happen. Well, what are you waiting for? Go enjoy your freshly built PC and I'll see you next time on Danny's Tech Channel. Yeah.